Coming up on this episode of the Preston North End Weekend Warm Up, we'll preview the Cardiff City match. We've got goalkeeping guru and Preston royalty, Alan Kelly, and our special studio guest is Matthew Sunday on a Friday. All that and so much more on this episode of the Preston North End Weekend Warm Up. So yes, a very warm welcome to this latest episode of the Weekend Warm Up, live here from Exton. We know it's not live, let's just pretend it is, because our very special guest is Matthew on a Sunday. So welcome to the Weekend Warm Up. I know that yes. you're really happy to be here, yeah. and, <laughs> and you've watched all the previous episodes which are available on YouTube. But more importantly, um, you've played 60 Minutes this week, in the uh, in the Central League Cup, it was an exciting finish. That three-two win over Fleetwood Town. But more importantly, I think for you, sixty minutes under your belt. So, most important question: How is it? How are you, how are you feeling? Um, no, yeah, good, definitely. Um, it was good to get that little run out and you know come out injury-free. But um, it's always important in the process to try and get those minutes in, get that match sharpness back, and you know build from there. How has the period of time from you arriving to here being for you, given the fact how unlucky you were to have got it the injury pre season and then sort of halfway through coming back happened again. How's it been? Yeah, I mean, it's been pretty frustrating, but I, um, you know, the staff have been really helpful with me and worked with me for this time and brought me to where I am now, so I'm happy and I'm ready to go now. Good. Fingers crossed for yeah, you. Fingers crossed. We'll talk more with Matthew between now and the end of the show. Uh, we'll also hear, of course, from the rest of the squad in the preview and the build-up to the game against Cardiff City this weekend. And we've also had a massive chat, when I say massive, we couldn't stop him talking, with Alan Kelly. We all know about his dad, he's got his picture, but we're talking about the picture, his face on the stand at the town end. Well, let's find out a little bit more about little Alan Kelly, Alan Kelly Jr. He, at one, he starts, we've edited all the bit about him moving his fingers in different positions as a goalkeeper. They're all a bit crazy, I think. But let's start with his time coming into Preston, born and brought up, as you would imagine, a Preston North End fan. And everybody talked about Brian Clough taking his kids on the bench. But did you know Kel's first views at Deepdale were from the very same place? Yeah, I think I'd like to say I was hired help because... Um, <laughs> We had Snowy hanging around, we had George Ward with the kit man and Harry Hubbock. And I was a fetcher and carrier from literally sort of like eight, seven, eight years old. And I've said before, it was, you know, going into Preston was like going into a playground for me. So I knew every nook and cranny of the stadium. I just knew um, what jobs needed to be done. You know, you would have uh, George Ward, who was a, a Cockney and, and came through the war and the Blitz and all that lot. And, He'd be shouting stuff at me, you know, go and fetch this and do this. And I'd walk in and Andy McAteer would be there or Mick Baxter. I remember once Mick Baxter, I got his kit out for him. This is match day. I got his kit out for him, put his shirt down. As I'm walking, he threw uh, a 10 pence piece or whatever it was at the time at me. I spun round, caught it. He went, ooh, ooh, not bad, son, not bad, son. I was only like me out to a grasshopper. <laughs> Walked out, put the money, went over to Ed's shop and, uh, and bought a pound of chocolate. But um, <laughs> that was it. My, my Saturdays were down at Preston, um, in before the team were there. You know, I'd run the bath at the end. Uh, Snowy was around at the time and a lot of people around Preston, around Deepdale would have known him. Um, he would have uh, made sure, like, let, sort of like logistics operations uh, manager, which didn't exist then, but, you know, somebody had to do it, i.e. run the big massive bath that was the size of an Olympic swimming pool, things like that. So uh, I would do that and then I would cut up the carbolic soap into big squares like this that uh, nobody used because it removed the two layers of your skin. So all those <laughs> memories and, and um, experiences, um, you know, come flooding back now and then sat on the bench. So you'd have had um, Nobby Styles was the manager um, and then my dad sat next to him. Um, and then the, as the, you know, I think there was only two subs then. So there's two subs. And then, then there was little old me sat on the end and uh, just watching the football from over the, you know, from the little seat and the barrier that was in front, you know, and just just incredible, really. When, when you think about it now and look back into it, it was it was surreal, really, and probably the dream of every Preston North End fan. I'm going to have to ask you the, this next question now because I'm melting here. So I've got, I'd hidden this. I wanted, I wanted to unveil it later, but I'm melting. 
because the radiators have come on at home. <laughs> so I'm sitting here going, I can't do it anymore. I can't. I'm going to have to show you. There we go. I, think, oh. I don't think you wore this, but this is the only goalkeeper. I didn't, no. This was when I realised how bad a uh, footballer I was. So I thought I'll try and become a goalkeeper instead, which I'm guessing. Ooh. Which I, Ooh. <laughs> Yeah, I said that. I said that, that Kelly. I said that. I'm guessing that's even, how you... Even, even, my, even, my dad's, even my dad's pointing at you now. Just yeah, but there. George, George is nodding. George is there going, he's right. He's right. In fact, your dad's going to oh, be yeah. fair. He is, he is right. So, which is why, uh, despite the fact that you do come from Preston North End's greatest ever goalkeeper, you very nearly were, were a spark. You, so how near did you get to being an electrician? About 18 months in. So when I, the, the story is, obviously, I was at school, but I was an outfield player. Um, Glenn Campbell broke his finger in a pre-season game um, and I, when I was just about to leave school and obviously I was watching, still carrying on my day job which was uh, putting the kit out and helping everybody else. And I was up at um, the old Courtauld's uh, training pitch which is uh, near Junction 31 there now and um, Glenn, hit, Glenn broke his finger and then I was on the sideline so my dad said just go in, go in the goals. So I went in the goals Pulled off a couple of saves. My dad got worried because I'd been offered uh, a four-year apprenticeship at uh, Leyland Motors, which I'd accepted. Um, and then as a result of that, I could see my, my dad didn't want to want to push it because he was all about getting a trade. And it, as it, you know, people know, he was a, a plaster before he, he, as he was doing a football over in Ireland and a, and a certified hairdresser and all this lot. Although some of the haircuts we had as children, you wouldn't think so. Um, <laughs> but he... He could see he was worried. But anyway, I went off. I went and um, started my apprenticeship at Berlin Motors. I did that for probably just short of 18 months. And in between time, I was playing for the reserves as a goalkeeper. You know, and um, I think my dad didn't think that the possibility that I would become a professional in any way, shape or form. So it was happening me just to, I think, I think he saw it as us helping the club out because they obviously they're on the knees at that time. And um, so, yeah, I'd have my overalls on, meet, meet the bus at, at four o'clock in the afternoon at, on the motorway bridge at Leyland. And then we're going down to Wolves, losing 6-0, getting back, cycling back home, uh, getting up at half five in the morning and cycling to Leyland for a day's work the day after. So, yeah, a little bit different from today's uh, Premiership uh, players. Just, just a little bit. In, in terms of when you actually came in then, because North End had started tumbling, hadn't they, for reasons... Yeah. Not all on, on the, I mean, the results obviously on the pitch, but in terms of everything that was happening behind the scenes, North End was a, a club that was that was looming ever closer and closer to extinction to a certain degree. So in you come, and then when North End having their worst ever season, the best run that they had, well, I'll let you explain that run of five, seven games that you came in for. I played the last 13 games of that season. Just the ones then, that you will always tell me about, because you don't mention the ones where you lost. Do you only tell me about those ones where we lost on the debut? So we lost two one on the debut against Crew at home. So we'll we'll forget that one. But um, well, you John, did because I had to tell you to get the book out to tell you about those games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the problem is it's that it's that long ago, isn't it? So you know, um, but Jonathan Clark was in charge, and um, in a series of incidents, I think John Platt was the the goalkeeper at the time, and he'd done his back, and then Phil Harrington yeah. came in on loan and um, had, had broke his ankle. And then there was there was only me left. It took me back to that bench when I was a little kid, like, go and fetch the shirt, go and cut the soap up, turn around, he went, might as well put him in. <laughs> so played played on the uh, on the Saturday against Crew, and then back, lost or drew the next couple of games, and then we went on a five-match a winning streak, winning the way at, I think, Mansfield, Tranmere, um, I can't remember the rest of them, but anyway, we, we went on, we won five on the bounce, which was incredible that time. Imagine we were, you know, we were second bottom of the football league, 91st out of 92 league clubs. Um, so it was just, it was just surreal really in terms of, but it felt to me, it didn't feel any different because I'd always filled in. I'd always lent a hand, always helped out, was always a part of the furniture, if that makes sense, in terms of being in and around the place. So 
it was like, oh, Kells, lad, will will step in and you know I'll play in this you know highly pressurized uh, situation where we had no floodlights and you know everybody wasn't happy. And I think I've said to you before, I think we lost at home in Cambridge. I think is, 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 it springs to mind, and you know there was a signpost from the fans as I came off. It was fans out, players out, directors out, everybody out. It was that low. It was, um, you know, it was a real low point in the in the club's history and. I remember coming out of the old director's um, entrance at, um, at Deepdale um, and as I, I think it's on Lawthorpe Road and as I came out of there, there was 200 fans there and they were wanting to rip everybody to shreds, quite rightly so. But I popped my head out the door and... Uh, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Oh, it's Kelly's lad. He's walking home. So I had my little bag and off I went. <laughs> and it was like, you know, this, this sea of fans opened up and off I toddled. Down deep down the road, <laughs> so Tom Finney Way as it is now, and and off home. So then that was, that was that was a highlight, not being ripped to shreds. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, they said it does say a lot about the time, and I remember it myself. It was, it was hot, and yet that next season, it couldn't have been feeling wise at least. Anyway, it was the opposite end of the spectrum, wasn't it? Oh, just, I think I mean, pitch goes down, McGrath comes there. in. That's, What's that? That's the, that? That's the trophy for. Um, that we, that we were given by the club on promotion in the following season. So we'd gone from, as you say, the depths of despair to, to, to winning promotion in, in, you might say, you know, Pep Guardiola type football. We were playing five at the back, uh, sweeper, Bob Atkins stepping out and, and spraying balls left, right and centre. You know, oh, Gary Swan, you know, third man runs from midfield to get goals. Banzini and uh, Ronnie Hildersley and all these names that come from that hopefully are still in my memory because it seems so long ago but I don't think there's been any any sort of similar type contrast to go from absolutely despair to then suddenly you're playing in front of 19,000 people against Northampton on a Tuesday night you know and it'd be Friday night. Friday night wasn't it Northampton well you'll, you'll know better than me but yeah I doubt yeah, it you can't I got that wrong <laughs> during the week uh, <laughs> but um, I do remember that, yeah, because we went out for a pint after and it was uh, the pub was open on Friday, so to celebrate, yeah. But anyway, to go from that that low point then to this and seeing the, the place re-energised and, uh, and the people pressed and really enjoying, you know, supporting the football club. I mean, it's, you know, for a young lad, you probably only appreciate that now at the time. It was just, you know, you just got on with it, really. Considering the amount of times that you broke your leg, the fact that you played... Over 150 times for North End. He's quite exceptional, isn't it? Well, in, in two respects, one, one coming back from the yeah from the the leg break from the motorcycle. You know, I was happy to play one game, but yeah, um, I mean, up until that first major injury, you know, I was over 50 games, and um, in '87, I think it was, I went. They sent me. Preston sent me down to Tottenham. I don't know if fans will probably remember this, and I was I went on trial, and the team would have been. Um, uh, Ozzy Ardiles, um, Hoddle, all the all all the names that were in that FA Cup final of '87, I was playing against, um, and it was incredible. Uh, Ray Clements was the goalkeeper at the time. Bob Wilson was the goalkeeping coach, and um, they sent me down. Added us to as a break. Or, I tell you what it was. It was in the Great Storm. You weren't born in '87. There was a massive storm in London. It took down everything, and I slept through it. <laughs> The lad from Preston slept through it. I remember the lady, she was called Jane in the dig. She came down in the morning. She went, are you all right? I went, yeah, great sleep. She went, I know. The house, and I looked outside and there was just destruction everywhere. There was trees down. Uh, seven Oaks became four Oaks because that's how, bad, that's how bad it was. So that was the great storm that I slept through. But anyway, I digress, as you said I would do. Uh, but all those, with the injuries, with the two broken legs, took me 18 months or you're missing, you know, Upwards of seventy-five games, uh, ruptured, ruptured cru cruciate ligament, which was treated slightly different at the time because um, I didn't, I didn't get surgery. They just let me play on, but every time I dived, my leg went numb. So at the time, <laughs> I do remember it's towards the end of the season. A lot of the fans, what's he, what's he sat down for again, on the plastic pitch, uh, because I couldn't feel my leg from the knee down. That was it. So Bob Atkins had to come and pull it. So it took the pressure off the nerve. Just a little bit of medical stuff for you, you know. So that's what you played through at the time. Yeah. Um, so 
So instead of yep. skillful Bob, we should have called him Dr. Robert by the sounds of things. Sit down there, youth. As he needs it. Sit down there, youth. I'll sort you out. <laughs> like that. That's it. Oh, yeah. Everything's coming back now. Get up. Bing. <laughs> so, so I probably, I probably missed about, I'm going to say, 75 games for Preston. So I would have been up, getting on for two, 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 five, two fifty, yeah. But I always looked at it, and you know what I'm like. I've always looked at it from that point where I got knocked down by the motorcycle. I've always looked at it. Everything was a game gained in my in my book. So, um, you know, when you coincide the injuries with the plastic pitch, then something had to give. Well, the next time you broke your leg, it was a vicious tackle from a from a well noted vicious opposition player, wasn't it? Yes, um, that uh, that that beast called Alex Bruce. Nicest man in the planet. Oh my god! He came round the next day, right? So I was on my couch, and he came. So that's I had to get up from my couch with my, with my massive pot on, which is about three stone, with the old crutches that went under your arm. With I didn't have a, a remote control. So I had to change the ch channel with two pool cules taped together, <laughs> like that, right? So I was nearly about to change, and there was only four channels, none of this streaming like right now. It was, I was just about to change it, knock on the door. Alex Bruce, he came there, and he just did that. He went, I'm sorry, and he gave me a bar of arrow. Brilliant. <laughs> and then he ate it. He ate it? Yeah. I took, lot, I took that long making the tea. I had to make the tea as well. Right? <laughs> I've been broken into. I saw I get so when I came back, all there was left, the, the whole thing was split open, all there was there was crumbs, just crumbs <laughs> of chocolate. I'm really sorry. I was more devastated about the arrow than I was about the leg. I mean, I, every time I see if I see him now, he, he's still apologetic about it, you know. So there's something, you know, because like, he's such a wonderful man and you know he does so much as well for the community, what have you, but yeah, he ate me chocolate. Well, at least you've not bitter about it all these years later. No, not at all. Move on. Arrows are on sale at a news agent's near you now. Just don't let them get in the hands of Alex Bruce. And we'll have the rest of the interview with Alan Kelly later. You'll be able to watch this on YouTube and understand what on earth I've just been talking about. But okay, yeah. it can't <laughs> even make sense to him either, but it does make sense to a certain degree. So, um, it is very clear from your accent that you are not a Preston boy, as much as I'm sure the longer you're here, you will end up talking with a nasally sort of twang and accentuate the last part of every word like that. That's one of the things that you do. But in terms of a little boy growing up in America, from Philadelphia, why, why football? Why not um, what we would call American football or baseball or basketball or stuff like that? What was the thing about footy that got you? Um, I'm I'm not really too sure. I think just playing it with some friends growing up, I just kind of got into it through that. And then um, my father, he um, played when he was younger himself, so I guess he kind of, um, you know, just edged me on more in that sort of direction and then from there just kind of took off. When did you start to think, actually, this, this could be for me? I'm not going to become a... Did you want to be anything else other than a footballer? Was there anything else in your locker? Um, what would you have been? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. I think I was, re I'm not sure really, to be honest. I think I was just really planning on going to college and just seeing what went from there. I never really had thoughts about the future, to be honest, when I was too much younger. I was just kind of going with the flow of everything, you know, just having a good time, having fun. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, I say this to my kids all the time as well, and not that you're, well, you, I am old enough to be your dad, to be fair. <laughs> so let's move very quickly on. So, <laughs> so you, had, you, you know, you, you'd had a, a playing career across America from starting out, but then you came across to Manchester United. So how, how did you feel about leaving home to come across to Europe? Um, I didn't really think too much about it at the you time. You were quite laid back about a lot of stuff by the time. <laughs> yeah, I think I was. Um, yeah, looking back at it, now that I'm a bit older, I realise like how much of a big step that actually kind of was. But um, at the time, I just thought like, oh, I'm going to play football over there now. So it was just kind of normal. Is that, is that fair to say that that's 
generally you still knowing about? Are you generally still quite relaxed and sanguine about quite most stuff? Yeah, I think I don't really put too much pressure on things, or try not to at least, but um, yeah, I guess that's just me. So in terms of getting here, as I say, we as, as fans want to see you playing and you know in the first team and giving yeah. it rock all up and down that right hand side. Yeah. So how hard is it then to settle in? Decent enough lads? No, yeah, everyone's been great. Are you sure? Yeah. We won't yeah. tell them it's fine, it's just between <laughs> <a little> bit. <laughs> no, no, they've all been great, really. Yeah. They've all, you know, welcomed me pretty well, so I've enjoyed it. It does feel that way here at Exeter. No, whenever I've come in, there's always a, a cheery, welcoming mood about the place. Yeah. How much has that helped you being part of the Preston family? Um, definitely has helped me a lot because, um, you know, when you've always got someone trying to like speak to you, ask you how you are, you know, check up on you. It does really make you feel a bit more welcome and um, a bit more at home, really. What do you do when you're not here? Do you have things that you like to, I mean, we, the, the examples of, well, maybe not good examples from your teammates that we've had. <laughs> um, we've had uh, Emil Reese pretty much just like sleeping, I think. Uh, Daniel Everson, sleeping again I think mostly as well and learning his, his own language as much as our language is very good. <laughs> Gally likes playing the guitar, oh. stuff like that. Have you heard him play the guitar? No. If he asks he's brilliant. <laughs> we all know that as well and that's pretty much it really so a hobby. Dog walking is, is one as well, a few of the lads oh. like dog walking. I mean I don't have any pets right. that I wouldn't know about. We can get you one. That you don't know about. Um, no, yeah, yeah. I don't know. My nice missus has sneaked one in. Fine. So what? What would you do for fun then outside of here? If we were to say, "Come on, then, Matthew. What are we going to do?" Um, I guess I'd say I do game quite a bit. Okay. Um, I did cook quite a lot. I did used to cook quite a lot, but I've gotten into HelloFresh now, so. Kind okay. of lost a bit of That's creativity. That's still sort of cooking. It's just yeah. that they give you the ingredients. Yeah. Other food delivery type things are available. We do have. It's all right, isn't it? It's a lot of time. You know, if you're in a rush. What's your favourite dish? Um, that they provide, or just if you were to say, "This is what I want," send me the ingredients because they, they don't do that. But <laughs> there are places that probably do do that. This is not an advertising feature, just so you know. It just so <laughs> happens that. We, there are other ones available. So if you were to go, it would be, get your chef's hat on. You're getting in there. What are you what are you cooking me? I'll come around for your for your house for tea. So what are we have? Um, um, I guess my go-to. I usually like to cook jollof, jollof rice, and um, like a stew, like a chicken stew. I think that's my signature piece. But I just kind of like to make it up and just find different stuff I would like to cook. Like jelly yeah. and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I don't know no, about not that. Jelly, not jelly. Like, yeah. not, not anything. There. Yeah, not just anything. Yeah. Stuff you've got to have yeah. spaghetti in there, <laughs> dog food from a dog, I may or may not have a So you're cooking for us, but not desserts? Um, no. Well, actually, yeah. Have you changed your mind on the dessert thing? Because in the <laughs> programme, not too long ago, mm. you were not too bothered. Candy, you said. Yeah, I used to eat candy. I did like to kind of bake, but um, it was mostly just pretzels, you know, like soft pretzels. Okay. So I think that's What's a soft the pretzel? Thing. That sounds like you just not put it in the oven long enough. Um, just like, have you heard of Auntie Anne's? Like, yeah, but we put powdy powder down for them. <laughs> it's it's, um, <laughs> it's, no, um, it's like a pretzel shop. And they just do lots of different pretzels. Right. And it's just, I don't know, it's just like a, like a hard pretzel, but just bigger and soft. Okay. It's nice. Right. Yeah. Well, look out. For, well, maybe you can bake some for us, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll give it a go. I'm just trying to get you to make me food. And <laughs> yeah. That's all it is, really. Okay, so that'll do. That'll do for dessert. So that's good. So we're learning a lot about you. I'm going to talk a little bit more in a second about your uh, TikTok stuff that you do. All right. Well, because we've discovered that he's on TikTok this week, so we're going to have a chat about that. But he says, of course, there is a football match this weekend. Cardiff City are the opponents for Preston North End. So let's have... Let's have a chat with one of uh, your teammates, but first of all, of course, head coach Frankie McAvoy. Yeah, Steve's done well with them over the, you know, the last three games. 
I think they drew, uh, then they lost to QPR, and then they won uh, the last game before you know, the, the international break, where they beat Huddersfield 2-1. So he seems to have stabilised the ship a bit. Uh, back three, whether he plays two up top or a 3-4-3 three, three, or 3-5-2, three, is something to ourselves. Uh, and he's, he's done well and he's got them well prepared. You know, we've watched some of the, the stuff and the analyst boys have prepared uh, our, our stuff in terms of watching them and seeing where we think we can hurt them and where they're strong. So he's done well, uh, a bit like myself, when you get an opportunity, a chance, you know, the back end of last season where you get a good response for the players. He seems to have had that as well. And I believe so that he's been given the job to the end of the season. So... Yeah, listen, it'll be, a, it'll be a tough a tough game, as they all are. But, you know, Steve's done well, and, you know, I wish him nothing but the best, but obviously, no for Saturday. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge club card. They've been in the Premier League, they've been sort of right at the top of the Championship for a long time as well. So I think we know, you know, it's going to be a tough game. We, like we said, we don't know what we're going to expect, but all we do know is that it's going to be a tough game, and there's a lot of quality in that team. So what we need to do is try and continue the good forum that we've had at Deepdale. You know, ask the fans again to get behind us uh, because. There's nothing better than, than seeing the support. Yeah, looking forward to getting back to Deepdale. It's been a long time and uh, you know, can't wait to play in front of the fans again. Right, let's get back to the really important stuff about you on TikTok, which is not a big thing for me as such, but I know it is for an awful lot of people out there and a lot of people follow you. And you come up with some good stuff on there. So tell us about TikTok. Um, I guess that just kind of started during lockdown. Um, just out of boredom and, you know, seeing all these different trends and stuff, but thinking, you know, I could have a go at it. And um, a few of did pretty well, yeah, actually did well. So I just kept on doing them and then I think I just hit a wall and just gave up. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Not literally. Yeah, not literally, yeah. Some of the ones I've seen you do, you've made it look like to the <laughs> one where you throw in like a hoodie like that and then you're... You, what is it? What's your name on uh, TikTok? What yeah. do people find you? Matt, Matt on a Sunday. Matt on a Sunday. Yeah. See what you've done there, because it's, it's <laughs> clever, really. Yeah. Um, but you can follow him all seven days of the week. I don't know why I said that. A bit rubbish. But the whole um, visualisation of stuff, I've got to ask you about, because again, match day programme, because we haven't heard much from you, so this is our opportunity to do that. You quite like anime and manga stuff, don't you? So tell us about your love for that, and I suppose the islands of Japan as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just kind of got into anime, really. When I was younger, watching, um, I watched Naruto quite a lot, and um, Dragon Ball Z is called, a different one's called. But um, just from that, I just kind of grew into it and just expanded more and more. And um, I think that also grew my interest in Japan in general. And so from there, I just kind of, you know, it's piqued my interest, really. Have you ever been there? Would you like to go there? Um, no, I haven't been, but I'm planning on going next year, actually, yeah, in the summer. It looks so. amazing. Yeah, from yeah, what really I see. Does. I'd quite like to go and watch a baseball match, but you, you don't really like US sports, <laughs> no. do you? No, it's a US sport, it's a sport for everywhere, but uh, I quite like that as well. Um, because somebody said to me, you liked cartoons, and it's not, it's not a car. I've like, got really excited, because I do like <laughs> cartoons. I could talk to you about cartoons all day long, yeah. but teach me something about... You, are you into cartoons? Just check in. Um, do you watch I mean, cartoons? I used to, but uh, well, I feel grew like... Up. Yeah, I well, think... Grew up. <laughs> grew up. Still loves his cartoons. Yeah. Grew out of them a bit, um, yeah. So what would you have... What, what's Because I love Gumball, have you ever seen? Yeah, Amazing World of Gumball. Gumball, yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> that. Apple and Onion is a sort of a, an Anglo-American mm. crossover. Mm. Apple and Onion's Apple worth and a watch onion. if you've been on there. Mm. And I quite like... There's an Australian family of dogs called Bluey which is a favourite one in the house at the moment. It's good on the Disney Channel. Again, this is not an advert, but uh, <laughs> other cartoons are available. But, it's, but what you're into is not a cartoon, is it? It's quite a, um, is it quite serious? Um, some of them are. It depends on what you're watching, to be honest. There's quite a wide variety of them, and um, they can actually get like kind of dark and then also like extremely light. So um, it's whatever balance you want and are interested in. Okay, well if you're going to get us in to one, like as our opener if you like, to it, is the one specifically that you say, try this one? Um, <laughs> uh, maybe One Punch Man, just because it's short, 
it's a bit, it's kind of funny and then easy to watch really. So I think that's the easiest one I'd say. Your, is it Naruto that you like? The guy who makes that, I think there's a crossover with stuff that he's done in terms of computer games as well. Yeah. And you were saying before about you liking sort of computer games, because this is something I need to get out of my system. This could be cathartic mm -hmm. as well, because quite a lot of your teammates, they quite like putting the headsets on and that's, yeah. are you in that gang? Um, I mean, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of the headsets, but you do kind of need them when you play. Right. Especially when you're playing Call of Duty. Well, right. Um, are you yeah. so? Are you one of the one of the codders? Um, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> thing now. Yeah, sort of. I don't really like the game, but people play, and it's you know good to be on with so friends what's your, and stuff. Which is the one really that you would say? I'm going to go home now, and I'm going to play Missile Commando. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why is he laughing? <laughs> Um, I think Do I would say. Do people still play Missile Commander? Which minute? I've never heard no. of it. You've never heard of Pac? You've heard of Pac-Man? Yeah, Pac-Man. Right. Yeah. It's same sort of era on the Atari. Oh yeah. That's it. Yeah. Oh, okay, I know what you're talking that, about. That's yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. I sold it now. That's sad that I ended up visualizing stuff. So what? What's your number one game? What are you going to go home and play? Um, uh, League of Legends. I'm a big fan of League of Legends. Okay. And um, can you get that on the Atari? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> no. It's just a computer game. Yeah. They were computers, you know. By the way. <laughs> yeah. Probably available in all good antique shops near you. <laughs> right. Thank you. Good to chat to you. I'm gonna let you escape in just a second. But before I do, we've got to say, um, coming up now is the second part of our Alan Kelly chat. Now, uh, I was explaining who Alan Kelly is before, but he was from the same sort of era as the Atari, really, in the Commodore 64, but a little bit older as well, just in case he's watching. You know it as well, he is very old. Um, but he helped here in his time as a goalkeeping coach. He had, we had Jordan Pickford, Sam Johnston, Deck the first time around, went on to play uh, in the Premier League and internationally, of course, as well. So that's where we'll start, taking goalkeepers to the next level. I think the reasons that we spoke about earlier, being able to, them to look at me and knowing I've walked in their shoes, both as a young lad, you know, particularly when I was at Preston, so I think it was coach at Preston, 240 games, whatever it is, so, and a lot of those were, would be with, with Jordan and Sam and, and the experiences of being promoted. And I suppose in Jordan's case, it was that next step for him to see one, if uh, Sunderland would sell him or bring him back as a number one to play in the Premier League. So, um, you know, that, not that that was on, on my mind. It was just that what, what could Jordan, what could Sam, what could Stuckey, uh, what could Declan, you know, what could these goalkeepers do for Preston? Um, and all that experience that I'd been through as a young lad, particularly with Preston, um, particularly facing up with the pressure of being the goalkeeper, um, how could I put that in a way that was relatable to a younger goalkeeper coming from a, an experienced goalkeeping coach like, like myself? So, um, and how, how did I do that? I've, I've always done that. I treat them all the same. So you can be England's number one. You can be playing in the fourth division. You can be whatever you want to be, but you're treating the same. You train the same. The knowledge is, is passed on the same. Um, you know, it's it's about creating and I've, and we do it at Everton now, it's about creating an environment where everybody, one, wants to improve, two, they've got somebody with the knowledge and the experience to be able to call on to improve, and then three, putting that together in a group where you're working hard together, you're all pushing each other, you're all trying to be better every day, and that includes me, um, to challenge each other. And that, So when you, when you go home, you can actually think, I've done my work today, I've prepared myself, I'm ready to play on a Saturday. Now, even we know as a goalkeeper, there can only be one. But if you if you're number two or three or four, and you go home and you you feel that you've done a week's work or a body of work that you could go in and play on a Saturday for your team or any other team, then at least that gives you the satisfaction of being ready. And it might sound strange and it might sound so simple, but it's about fulfilling that that performance element for them as well. So in terms of the goalkeepers that you mentioned, then obviously deck and Jordan and Sam all went on after being with us, and I know Dex come back again, but to play in the Premier League and internationally as well. Could you see that in them? Did you Could you recognise that they were going to be 
top flight. I mean, obviously it would have been better if it had been with us, but did you see that they were good enough to be at that top level? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they're all supremely talented at a young age. Um, I think they're all represented the country at uh, underage level as well. And yeah, it, it, it was, you know, and when you've got that framework or, and you've got that, I think it's like a thirst for knowledge about they want to take that next step. They want to, you know, they, they're probably coming, uh, in Jordan's case, he was coming up a step up from the league he'd been, I think he'd been with Bradford in the league below as well. So he was, he was stepping up to the championship with us. Um, and he was always, and as I said to you before, you know, about challenging himself, he was always doing that. Sam had been on loan, I think, at Doncaster as well and a few other places. And, yeah, the, 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 for me, supremely talented is probably the phrase I can, I can sum them all up with. Declan, uh, when he was with us, when we, we lost out in the playoffs, he played that full season, was fantastic in that year. Um, and, 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 as you said, ultimately went back to Norwich and I think played 16 Premier League games the following year. Um, would have been great, I think, for him to stay with us another year, um, you know, to, to, to sort of fulfil what he could have done with Preston North End. But when that didn't happen, then, you know, it, it opens the door for somebody else. Um, and, and, in, and in walks Sam, and, and Sam, Sam was and is, and is proving, you know, to be such a, a quality goalkeeper. And, the, you know, the, the aura of the man and just a great bloke as well, what he brought to Preston, that medal there, he was part of that team that win that, that wins us promotion at, at the tenth attempt. So he'll be immortal. And the connection back. with his dad as well was always quite right. a nice thing, wasn't it? Absolutely. You know, and I knew Glenn from back in my days. Um, you know, as, as when I was playing as well. So again, all those connections that come together. Um, you know, so that would that would be a little bit of familiarity with me as well. So from his from his dad probably. So all those little connections come together, and then, you know, one he's got the talent. Two. We had the framework of a, of, a, of a fantastic team, Simon and Snod's uh, a management team, and then you get that as well for the for the the, the time for Preston losing out, you know, all those times at playoffs, and we go and win one. And again, you know, that that's something one of my one of my greatest memories ever in football. Well, I'll finish with that then because I'd, it's been hovering over your shoulder there, and obviously, so <laughs> poignantly because of 64 as well, and it being back in Wembley and uh, lucky enough to hear the stories from those guys in that era and what it meant to them. And obviously we weren't born then, but then in years to come, playoffs, the bane of our life, one of them being at Wembley. And then after Cardiff and, and Cardiff getting the chance to go to Wembley, you being part of it and that being a winner's medal over your shoulder rather than us going away and crying again after another total thing. I'll, let, I'll, I'll finish on that then. So what did that day mean and what sort of memories came to your mind and to your heart? Oh, don't start me now. You'll have me roaring again. I mean, you look at, I look at that where it started and the journey over to this, you know, in terms you said before about getting promotion 87, making my debut and then, culminating with, with, with the medal, I mean, just, that's a lifetime's work, isn't it? You know, when you look at it, and then, you know, with George, my dad, um, Les Daggers on that photograph, Alex Dawson, you know, and again, just, um, I, I was on Moor Park at the weekend. Um, my son was playing on Moor Park, and my older brother Dave was there, and we were talking about the memories we had about walking down Deepdale Road up to play a game of football, walking across from St. Greg's, because that was our school pitch on Moor Park, and I got asked to run the line as well, gave some shocking decisions. But anyway, that's another story from there. But I just look at that and, I, and it just, I just smile. Well, how can you not smile? You know what I mean? In terms of, you said before about, you know, my affinity with Preston and, and literally being born into it. But how lucky am I to, one, be born into that family, two, to have the experiences of playing for Preston, then coaching for Preston, you know, um, and, and then being able to stand on Moor Park, look back at your lad playing football, in the shadow of Deepdale, I'm a blessed man. And that is it for this episode of the Weekend Warm-Up. Don't forget, uh, if you're coming along, that the fan zone is open before and after the game, so get along nice and early to meet your mates and then have a chat, hopefully discuss three points. 
against Cardiff City. If you can't get to deep down, and we know that still as of yet not everybody can, then you can listen on iFollow, and if you are living abroad, you can watch the game as well. And if you haven't got tickets and you can get to Deepdale, he says, bear with me on this one, mype.com, you can buy them online or you can turn up in person at the ticket office right up to kickoff. So that's it. Have you enjoyed this episode of the weekend warm up? Yeah, it's been good, it's been fun. Good. <laughs> <laughs> He's also learned how to lie as part of this episode <laughs> as well. No, it, was, it was very interesting. And look, on behalf of everybody watching this, we'd, we'd love to see you back and fully fit and in that first team. And well, obviously not everybody wants to, because you means you'll take somebody else's place <laughs> out of the team. And we can get rid of Seb, I suppose, couldn't we? You could do such a job. He was a guest on here as well. Not as good as you. <laughs> Don't tell him I said that. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. I always end by giving it a come on you whites. Come on you whites. You've done it! <laughs> <laughs>